Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to get started in a couple moments. I just want to acknowledge you all in the room, though, first, and also our folks in the virtual audience, too. Thank you for coming in today. Um, welcome to Workman Klein Center. If you want to stay involved with future comings and goings at the center, please head to our website for bringkleincenter.org slash get involved to hear more about our wonderful events and wonderful lineup of speakers. Without further ado, I will now hand it off to our actual speakers of the day. Thank you all so much for joining us. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Adam Holland. I'm the project manager for the Berman Client Center's Lumen Database. I'm thrilled to be here moderating what I expect will be a fascinating and fruitful discussion. Before we begin, I would just like to alert everyone that this conversation is being recorded, but that the recording is facing us. None of your faces are going to be on the recording. And so you don't need to worry about that. However, if you choose to participate by asking a question on the mic, your voice will become part of the recording for the event. So we anticipate having um, a fascinating conversation here, and then we'll spend the latter portion of the session opening it up to Q&A. So uh, I hope that we'll have a, a lively discussion on that front as well. So without further ado, I'm pleased to be able to introduce to you our guests. To my immediate right is Felix Rita, who is a former member Representative to the European Parliament and is currently a project manager at GFF. Um, I'm going to give it a try and you guys can laugh at me. Gesellschaft für Freiheit the Society for Civil Rights, um, which is a German organization that defends fundamental and human rights through legal means. And we are also joined to his right by Malte Spitz, who is the co founder and secretary general of GFF. And while they're certainly going to tell you more about what they're about, primarily they're here to bring to your attention the brand new European legislation, the Digital Services Act, most specifically its provisions involving researcher access to data and the affordances and opportunities that that might provide for strategic litis, uh, litigation in the public interest. And so um, I'll turn it over to you, Malta. Thanks a lot. Uh, I uh, just uh, say a couple of words on our NGO work and uh, afterwards uh, Felix will explain a little, bit, will explain a little bit extra on our GSA work too. Uh, uh, GFF is an NGO who is really uh, uh, focusing on on uh, on uh, strategic litigation. So it's our really core issue, but it's not only in the digital rights field, but it's like in the uh, fundamental rights all over. But as a specific, I would say, like a specific uh, uh, focus, our uh, digital right, but at the same time, we also do cases on equal pay, on anti discrimination, on state surveillance, also old school type of uh, state surveillance, not only a digitalized state surveillance, and also examples on cases on mm -hmm. refugee rights. And now for the last two to uh, uh, three years, we have opened up more also uh, challenging uh, companies too. So our work is mostly against, uh, uh, is often against, uh, uh, it's often against uh, state actors, but now, we are also moving forward to go after companies. We already had a case against Meta, for example, which we won in the uh, uh, which we won in the uh, first instance, and and now is the DSA. I think. We will start even more st strategic litigation against 
large online platforms and uh, Felix will explain a little bit extra on the ideas and also on the on these new possibilities. Right, should I jump right in? Yes, please. Yeah. So um, I was a Berkman Klein fellow after I left the parliament and I was here in 2019, 2020. And uh, at the time, um, I feel the European Union was looking at platform regulation very differently. So uh, I was doing a lot of work from the perspective of the users of online platforms, especially in the copyright field also, uh, where uh, we had a lot of interactions back then. Um, at the time, there were issues around like content ID, for example, inadvertently blocking legal forms of speech. And uh, we had EU legislation that would really compel companies to um, uh, block all kinds of illegal content. And quite often, freedom of expression issues were kind of uh, left at the wayside because um, platforms would be kind of compelled to use relatively simplistic solutions to content moderation that would um, adversely affect the rights of users. And so uh, with the Digital Services Act, which uh, was adopted about a year ago, um, and is uh, about to fully uh, become applicable next year, uh, I feel that the, the tides have really changed because the Digital Services Act um, looks at users not so much as potential criminals or just consumers of what is going on uh, in the online ecosystem, but really as uh, citizens uh, who, who have rights and is kind of taking a much more fundamental rights-friendly approach to this. So I've put only three slides together because I don't want to bore you with the presentation, just to explain a few basic concepts if you have not um, followed the Digital Services Act before. So uh, this is kind of um, a simplified view of what kinds of um, online intermediaries are regulated by the Digital Services Act. Um, so it's a, a system of kind of um, increasingly uh, strong obligations but uh, has very basic obligations for any kind of on online intermediary. So that's not just social media companies and things like that, but also, for example, your internet service providers, DNS resolvers, and so on. And those basic obligations for intermediaries are very light. It's primarily like if you have customers in the EU, you have to have a legal representative in the EU. You have to be contactable for um, uh, regulators and things like that. And then you have uh, increasingly more burdensome or more strict obligations as we go into hosting providers. So for example, up until now, the EU did not have a notice and action system laid down in law. So, so it was really quite a lot of uh, companies were basically following the US Digital Millennium Copyright Act in the EU for copyright matters and also for non-copyright matters. That was kind of the sort of inofficial framework of how to deal with complaints against potentially illegal content. And so now with the Digital Services Act for the first time, there is a notice and action system laid down in EU law that applies to all hosting providers. Um, a subset of hosting providers are what uh, the, the Digital Services Act uh, conceives of as platforms. So these are primarily kind of public facing hosting providers that uh, organize the content that users upload. So for example, a simple web hosting service would not be considered an online platform, but something like Facebook or Wikipedia certainly would. Um, and those platforms have uh, increased responsibilities when it comes to uh, content moderation. So for example, they have to um, have a complaint system if something has been uh, removed or uh, a decision has been taken. Um, they also have uh, stricter transparency obligations when it comes to how their recommender systems work and things like that. And finally, uh, you have uh, the most far-reaching obligations for the so-called VLOPs. So VLOPs stands for very large online platform. It's not very, um, not a very imaginative term, but these are um, uh, platforms that reach 10% of the EU population. So something like 45 million active users and uh, they have to actively uh, engage in a risk assessment of certain systemic risks that are associated with online platforms. So for example, risks uh, in terms of dissemination of illegal content, but also risks in terms of the fundamental rights of users, um, uh, risks to public health, electoral uh, um, discourse, and things like that. And uh, basically, 
those uh, VLOGs are also the ones that uh, will have the most obligations when it comes to um, requesting access for research purposes. If uh, there are research teams that want to um, look into those systemic risks. And that's primarily also uh, what we want to talk about today because at uh, the Society for Civil Rights, we are really interested in testing these provisions in court and seeing what we can get out of them in terms of improving the respect for users' fundamental rights in the online ecosystem. But we are an organization of lawyers. We're not an organization of researchers or data scientists. And so we want to get the word out about these new opportunities to um, yeah, hopefully also encourage researchers to think about how this might be useful for your work. Um, you know, so yeah, all sure. you there. This is a great slide. And one of the things I think may not be immediately obvious to someone who's just coming to the DSA and its researcher provisions, its requirements provisions of the topic is how hotly contested these tiers are. So if you have been paying attention to this um, what, about six weeks ago, was the first moment wherein online providers had to self-certify to the EU whether or not they were in fact a VLOP. Because if you are, the calendar for your requirements is, is significantly accelerated. And so of course, Meta is a VLOP, Google is a VLOP. But a little further down the, the list, there was some, to me at least, extremely intriguing yes, no's um, most notably that Spotify, which I think simultaneously said they have over 120 million users within the EU, but was not a VLOP because some very arcane reasons. I wonder if maybe you can talk a little bit more about that and why the requirements for VLOPs are so powerful for the citizen, engaged citizenry you've described, but maybe not quite so desirable for the platforms themselves. Yeah, sure. So uh, what we've put on these slides are the ones that have self-certified as uh, a VLOP. So those are the ones that, you know, don't need to be prodded by the regulators, but are rather kind of saying at the outset, yes, we do consider ourselves to be a VLOP. And there you kind of see uh, you have a few search engines, which is also bizarre. I mean, I have to admit the last slide was simplified because um, search engines were added very late in the legislative process to uh, those the obligations for very large online platforms, even though they're not platforms, they're not hosting providers. So there's a little bit of a, uh, a lack of, of congruency when you look at how it was designed at the outset. In the end, uh, search engines do have to comply with those uh, risk assessment obligations and so on, even though they're not hosting providers. But um, yeah, so you have a few search engines, namely Google and Bing, you have some e-commerce platforms, and then you have a whole bunch of uh, social media companies. And then Wikipedia is the only, the, the odd one out in a way that it's not a company, it's uh, uh, the only nonprofit on the list and also has a very different approach to content moderation than any of those companies. Um, so those are the ones that are for sure on the list. And then there are a lot of question marks. So I would say in, in terms of uh, Spotify, it, it's something that could be challenged by the European regulators. So the European Commission um, uh, has the power to, to yeah, kind of ask additional information or also question this uh, self-designation. And the other uh, um, obvious omission from this are the adult entertainment platforms that all claim to have fewer than 45 million users in the EU, which is also open to debate, I would say. There are others that are being asked about, like Airbnb, for example, where I find it easier to believe that perhaps, you know, not, not quite as many people travel and rent hotels as we might think. Um, but yeah, those are the ones that we know for sure uh, that are, um, yeah, self-assigning as we love at this point. Um, uh, I would just uh, maybe quickly go for, back to the first one um, because uh, so when we talk about what researchers can get out of the Digital Services Act, I think um, uh, it's worth noting that not all of the requirements uh, for transparency are limited to those VLOPs. So if you are researching one of those platforms that was on the last slide, great. There will be quite a lot of opportunities to, to 
um, research them, but there is also some uh, interesting stuff that applies to all platforms. And perhaps also Adam can say a bit more about that because uh, there is a, um, a mandatory database in the Digital Services Act for the content moderation decisions that was very much inspired uh, by the Lumen project. And um, yeah, but unlike Lumen, it's going to be mandatory for all platforms. So quite interesting. Maybe we can also discuss um, from your experience, like what kind of research Lumen has facilitated as a voluntary uh, database of, of uh, content modifications, and maybe what you see also might be interesting research questions that can be, uh, yeah, in the future, hopefully answered through the digital services. Sure. So, um, as Felix points out, the DSA in Article 17, I believe, describes the mandatory database that must be built. It hasn't been built yet. We're very interested in what, what ends up being built, but then it will be populated essentially by the content moderation decisions that are made by all these platforms. And the VLOPs have to go into a little bit more detail, but all platforms that are making content moderation decisions are required to contribute to the database in some way. And quite similarly to what Felix mentioned about the EU essentially using a notice and takedown regime, although it was never instantiated in law, sort of flip that a bit. The United States Digital Millennium Copyright Act was the first legislation to put into law a notice and takedown regime. It's from that law that we get the concept of notice and takedown. But intriguingly, there's no piece of that law that mandates transparency. So I run the Lumen database, which is a Bergman Klein Center project, and we're a database that collects copies of the notices that are sent as part of notice and takedown. And we have about 25 million at this point, which we've gathered over a period of 20 years. Every single one of those was shared with Lumen voluntarily by a platform out of a greater interest in transparency, but they could stop. They could take them back. It's completely voluntary. And so one of the things that's most incredible about the DSA is that this database is mandatory and there will be universal participation. And so as Felix points out, the possibilities for useful research are almost, to me at least, incomprehensible because we know what we've been able to do with just the voluntary data that's within Lumen and the idea of Expanding that by several orders of magnitude is um, is just astonishing. So a few a few brief examples is that, is that appropriate at this juncture? Yeah. So Lumen was started to collect copyright takedown notices, and it was exclusively that for many years. And then as that mechanism spread into the zeitgeist, and people began to realize, well, hey, I, I can take things down. I don't really know why, or I may not have the legal. Um, pieces in place, but it's worth a try. The database has expanded to include takedowns related to defamation, private information, local laws. So if you're one country in particular is something illegal to be online, someone in that country might send Google or Twitter or whomever a takedown notice. And then it's up to them to respond either globally or geolocationally. I mean, if Roskomnadzor, which is the Russian regulatory agency, says Google, you're linking to material that explains how to use drugs. That's illegal under Russian law. Take it down. They may take it down globally. They make it down, take it down only in Russia. Stuff like that. But what we've also started to see with respect to this expansion of the idea of notice and takedown and also the type is what I can only describe as weaponization of takedowns. So, for example, Malta, if you write a book, and Felix thinks it's the greatest book in the world. Everybody should get to read it for free. And so copies it and puts it on their website. You could completely legally send a copyright claim to his hosting provider or to Google or any other search engine to delist it. My copyright's been infringed. Take it down. However, what we're seeing is someone who doesn't have the copyright asserting they have the copyright in order to achieve the removal of material that is broadly adverse to their interests in some way. Could be critical, could be reputation damaging, their opinion. 
And so they'll send takedown notices or other notices to minimize their online presence. And so we've had researchers both in the past and currently working with the Lumen database unearth rather elaborate schemes to do this, the scale of which I'm, I continue to be amazed by. So I'll just briefly name a few. You can always reach out to Lumen and we're happy to go into more detail or give you researcher access yourself. Um, but just very briefly, uh, right now, um, our Lumen Research Fellow, Shreya Tavari, is working on a large-scale scheme to weaponize DMCA notices, copyright notices, to control reputation online. And so she's identified a subset of approximately 100,000 notices, all of which can be traced to the same group of senders and from there probably to one individual who's paying this group of senders. And they use what's called the backdated article technique, which is, oh no, a newspaper has written an article pointing out that I'm violating EU law and maybe even have assassinated one of my rivals. I, I can't let that show up online if someone searches for my name. So I pay my organization to create a completely fictitious website that looks like another newspaper. I copy that article onto our website, and then I just change the date so that it appears to have been published a week earlier than the original. I then send a copyright notice to Google, Twitter, whomever, and say, the original has copied my fake article. Take it down. And because of the incentives of the DMCA, it's usually taken down. It's very easy to realize that this is a fake if you're a human being doing the detective work. But given that probably hundreds of thousands of these notices are sent every day around the world, very few of these organizations have the resources to do the human detective work. And so that's one of the things that Lumen makes possible by aggregating these. And so we've found this out, we've written it up, we've received bizarre threats from Swiss lawyers to drag Lumen into Latvian criminal court. Yeah, it was funny for publishing um, this work. So there's that out there. People are weaponizing existing legal structures to control their reputation online. Uh, closer to home and perhaps even more eyebrow raisingly, we have a US law professor who's explicitly interested in court orders. That is to say, something came before a judge in a US court, there was a proceeding and the court issued an official order. Of course, since it's Lumen, it's in order to take something down off the internet. And for most platforms, that's um, the gold standard. It's not just a DMCA request. It's not just a kind letter. It's, it's a court. It's a, it's a proceeding. You have to honor the law. And so to my, even years later, continued surprise, uh, this research found that as many as 10% of a sample of several hundred court orders uh, were fraudulent in some way. Some of them are explicit forgeries, and you're like thinking, well, what's a forged court order look like? Well, sometimes it's literally someone photoshops one URL out of a real court order, puts their URL in, and then sends that to Google. Again, pretty easy to figure out if you're looking for a problem. But if you're like, oh, yeah, this is cool, you're not going to notice. That's on the one end of the spectrum. Uh, uh, you can find that particular instance. There's a lot of news articles written about it. The perpetrator confessed later, and I believe this quote is, ha, I paid this some teenage kid next door $500 to do this for me. And it's all down from online. On the other end of the spectrum, there's a California company which has since gone bankrupt and its founders are on the run from the FBI that had a quite elaborate business model wherein they would fake a power of attorney, fake a defendant for a John Doe, draft a stipulated order of settlement, take it to an out-of-state judge and an out-of-state lawyer who everything looks good, they'd sign off on it and then have a real court order, real lawyer, real court, real judge, founded on fraud, and then take that back to Google. And this only came to light through research on Lumen, it led to a federal, um, excuse me, not a federal, uh, Texas state prosecution and the dissolution of this company. So those are just two examples 
This is the kind of thing Lumen exists to facilitate, this kind of research and this kind of social impact. And that's only with voluntary disclosures on the part of the 15 to 20 companies that share takedown notices with Lumen. So I ask you to imagine if every single company in these categories is submitting uh, takedown notice and content moderation decisions, I, I would hope that the environment for deliberate misuse and abuse would be uh, much, much less friendly. But I also suspect that we are going to learn that there's a much um, higher rate of incidence of misuse and abuse than anyone has previously imagined. And then finally, on the more positive side, it's going to make possible public interest strategic litigation with user interests in mind. Right. So maybe we should uh, um, talk a bit about uh, the research data access request, because one thing that we have found is that um, if there is a takedown notice, I guess the platform has an interest in transparency, at least some of them do, which is why they will voluntarily participate in Lumen. But of course, there's probably less of an incentive for the platforms to share information about their own content moderation that they do um, you know, uh, algorithmically, their own uh, recommender systems and so on. And so beyond kind of these clear cut cases of something has been blocked or has been kept online, um, the research data access provisions, which only apply to those large uh, platforms, allow request uh, researchers to request additional data um, that is necessary for public interest research. So um, basically, this is something that um, anybody who is affiliated with a research organization can try to um, get access to. Um, it's a fairly complicated process, which uh, I will try to briefly explain. But um, I think it's useful if you're researching any topic that um, is related to risks on platforms. So these systemic risks are listed in the Digital Services Act, but they are quite broad. So they include things like dissemination of illegal content. Um, they also include uh, risks to fundamental rights of users, and they're based, based on the European Charter of Fundamental Rights it's a pretty broad spectrum from speech issues to equality issues to social rights. Um, but it, the DSA also explicitly lists electoral discourse, so risk to electoral discourse, things like disinformation uh, in the run up to an election. It lists public health, which was probably very much um, inspired by uh, the platform issues uh, surrounding the pandemic. Uh, it also lists uh, uh, lists um, gender-based uh, violence as a uh, potential systemic risk. So if you are researching in any of those areas, you can try to get vetted um, by the European regulator as um, a researcher. And this regulator is then going to make a request for additional data access to the platform on your behalf. So uh, the way that this works is you can either go to the regulator of the country of establishment. And this is probably going to be from sometime next year. Uh, most of those platforms um, that we've shown are registered in Ireland. So usually it's going to be the, the Irish digital service coordinator, but you can also, if you are affiliated with an EU research institution, go to the digital services coordinator of that country for help. So um, what we've seen in the past with the data protection regulation was that uh, the Irish regulators were somewhat overwhelmed and overstaffed. And um, it's kind of debatable to what extent that was a deliberate policy choice or was just a, a question of public institutions having to uh, go after very large uh, companies uh, with nearly unlimited resources. But uh, the Digital Services Act has tried to learn from that process and has given more power of enforcement on the one hand to the European Commission and also to the other uh, regulators of other countries and also to a certain extent to civil society uh, who can bring claims on behalf of uh, different interest groups, which is also where, where we come in. So um, you try to get vetted, which means you have to describe how your research relates to those systemic risks, what your research question is, and what data you need from uh, one of those very large online platforms. Uh, the digital services coordinator, which is the regulator, then makes a data access request to the platform. 
and the platform can either comply with that request or they have to uh, justify why they cannot. And the reasons for um, refusing access are fairly limited. One is you don't have to, uh, the data. Um, so the platforms do not have to provide data that they don't have. Um, and the other, uh, which is a, a bit more problematic, is uh, that uh, disclosing the data would um, uh, violate their trade secret protection, which can, of course, be an incredibly broad um, uh, reason for refusing data access. But in those cases, the platforms have to make a counter proposal. So they have to say, well, this is what we can provide to um, uh, to answer this research question. And ultimately, the decision is then going to be up to the regulator whether to accept uh, that or not. If the regulator um, uh, refuses the data access, um, the researchers could uh, try to sue the regulator, or if they grant access, the platform could try to challenge that decision in court. So we do expect, uh, especially around this trade secret uh, question, quite a lot of litigation, and where there we want to also contribute to a solution that does not, uh, you know, uh, make this uh, tool useless uh, in practice. What uh, the researchers also have to do um, is to, to provide a concept for how to account for data protection and data security. And they should already do this as part of their initial request so that the, the regulator can evaluate whether um, they are uh, capable of uh, keeping the data that they're requesting safe, especially if it's sensitive uh, personal data. And um, in the proposal, there is uh, also um, a room for an independent third party body, which would act kind of as a clearinghouse between the platforms and uh, the, the researchers and also have help in this vetting process. So um, what we want to kind of explore maybe in the remainder of the hour is what kind of research questions uh, might be suitable, um, keeping those systemic risks in mind and also keeping uh, the companies in mind that uh, qualify as very large online platforms. So maybe we can put them back on um, just yeah to, to aid as a, a visual reminder. So uh, I come very much from the copyright field. So I'm personally quite interested, for example, in how um, social media companies like YouTube, which I think doesn't uh, uh, contribute to Lumen, mm -hmm. but, um, like how they have dealt with this, because like under EU law, at least, um, platforms like YouTube are required to, to use upload filters to uh, block copyright infringements, but only if those filters make sure that legal forms of expression, like quotations, for example, actually do go online. And it's a big question, like how they actually do that in practice and whether they do that because um, content that never gets uploaded in the first place, you don't know that it has been blocked. So uh, there, I think, uh, is a lot of room for using, on the one hand, this database of content moderation decisions, but also for researchers potentially to ask follow-up questions. But I could imagine that beyond the copyright field, in other areas, there would also be a, a lot of potential use cases, also looking at e-commerce platforms and things like that. So with that in mind, shall we turn it over to the audience to see what their uh, their particular initial interest might be? This is really terra incognita for all of us. So we turn it over to you. What what, uh, what opportunities jump to mind or what would you like to see happen? It's still very much a work in progress. As I mentioned, the database does not yet exist. Lumen, because it's really the only similar database in the world right now that's aggregating this kind of data, we've been in conversation with people at the EU Commission about ways in which they might usefully structure their own database, ways in which they might vet researchers, and the possibility of um, what I think of as tiered access to sensitive data. I mean, because it's it's hard to think of data that no one should research. You know, that's it's if it's that sensitive, it's probably pretty important. But um, what's on what's on your minds? I turn it to the audience. Yes, please, in the back. Uh, there's a microphone going around, so if you don't mind waiting till you have it to speak, please. Now it's on. Um, yeah, Andy Haupt, um, PhD candidate over at MIT. Uh, part of my research I do on, um, on YouTube. And here, I would like to bring on uh, something that I see as a limitation, but I'm, where I'm also curious about how to ask the question that that's around interventional access. 
uh, a lot of the potential systemic risks or harms uh, I would place as not only relating to the platform and not only relating to the user, but in the interaction of uh, users uh, and platform. For example, all sorts of questions around uh, radicalization, polarization through recommendation systems, which have been in prose a lot talked about, have very little empirical support, which like actually tests whether this happens. And there's always the problem that if you get some data from a platform, then there is the innocuous explanation, okay, these people were just in a social environment where they would have anyways radicalized. It's not because of the platform. So you would like to somehow establish some causality and one way to establish causality on, in platforms, and that's done all the time, is A-B tests. So you're testing one time this, one time this, and you look, okay, that, does this change something? And in my experience of talking to people in human subjects, boards, and so on, I think it's underappreciated that we are being tested on all the time by platforms. And in the data access provision in the DSA right now, I think it's just saying data. But it doesn't seem to me that we are going to be in a world where we're definitely not going to be in a world where um, I can come as a researcher and tell YouTube, OK, please run an A-B test for me. I will still need to work around that and get a browser extension, get the legal help with that, um, because my participants are violating terms of service from YouTube. This still seems to exist. Is there a way in which I could go and say, YouTube, OK, please give me some results from internal A-B tests that you have run um, about these and these things, for example, when introducing this feature, because that was a, would establish, an, establish some form of accountability regarding experimentation internally. So I think here, the idea being interventions, my hunch is that that's limited, and the question is, how about asking questions regarding internal A-B tests and internal experimentation by, by platforms as a researcher? Great question. Thank you. Would you like yeah. to start? I think that's a really good idea. My gut feeling would be based on the legal test. Um, this kind of data should fall under the data access request provision, provided that you know that the A-B test has taken place. I mean, that's always a little bit the difficulty and also one of our criticisms of the data access provision is that you kind of already need to know what you're looking for when you're making the request. Um, because uh, unfortunately, there is this relatively strict purpose limitation that your research has to relate to those systemic risks. But it doesn't say that you can only request, for example, content moderation data. So I would say the, the results of A-B tests would fall under those provisions. Um, it's going to be a difficult situation, perhaps, if you're saying, I assume that A-B tests have been uh, done on this particular question, like for example, how does this feature um, uh, affect minors on TikTok, for example? Or what if the platform says we haven't run those tests? And it might be a case of an overly specific denial. So I think in that case, it's going to be very important um, to have good relationships between civil society, academia, and the regulators, because the regulators do have some pretty far-reaching powers um, in terms of um, auditing the companies. Um, but yeah, I, I think in principle, that kind of data would fall under the research data access provision. Well, thank you. Malta, do you have uh, any insights on that? I think really that as more as the question relates to the issue of systemic risk as India, it, it, it uh, will be. So if you have AUP testing, on uh, on for example issues of uh, like uh, recommendation uh, prior to election campaigns they would say it's easier maybe as you are asking for a, a B test maybe for for uh, for uh, for uh, for uh, certain types of new advertisement mechanisms. I think also, especially arguing with the digital services coordinators to really show the impact of this data on kind of research for the on uh, systemic risk will help there. Mm. 
Perhaps to add to that, I mean, traditionally we have dealt with this problem when it comes to governments and public institutions. So we've done quite a lot of uh, litigation around access to information, and we also use access to information laws very actively in our own work. And uh, there you have the same problem. You need to know what to ask for. And um, in that respect, we found that open sources intelligence is a very important tool. So for example, you could use this public database um, uh, the same way that journalists and researchers have been using Lumen for many years to try to figure out if there is anything that looks fishy. And then you can try to build research questions based on the information that is already out there. So for example, if you're researching advertising, there is going to be a uh, uh, fairly strict um, transparency requirement on advertising for very large online platforms. So you could use that database to build some hypotheses and then ask more targeted questions um, as part of this research data access provision. The one thing that I would add to this great question is that, as Felix points out, Lumen has to an extent been used to do this. And one of the things that we've observed that's critical for successful research is at least some level of um, data interoperability. Now, I have every hope that the DSA is going to require some kind of standardized formatting, but it's easy to imagine the, the platforms making you know, a plausible case that, well, our content moderation decisions are based on XYZ, and therefore we have to give it to you like this, Whereas the other one says, no, it's one, two, three, we have to give it to you like this. And there won't be any way to do any kind of aggregate analysis across. But to the extent you're able to, we're certainly doing our best. There has to be some standardization because only then is the kind of research that you just propose really possible, which is I've noticed a pattern, whether it's through individual research or some sort of you know machine analysis, both of which have been done on Lumen, and then I start to ask the questions. You know, it's almost like a public records request. Yeah. Oh, I, I found five or six that look the same. Please give me everything pertaining to that material or these um, requesters, which in our experience is, is often where the, the really good stuff is, is who sent the request to begin with. And if you can establish patterns there, whether name or you know, le legal address, that sort of thing, that that's where you will start to see patterns. But I, I my personal read, and I'm, I'm, I feel like I reread this document once a week, I don't see anything yet that would allow you to say specifically, show me your internal testing, unless a user had already made a request for an explanation of a content moderation decision that coincidentally, was part of that internal testing. And then you could say something along the lines of show me all analogous content moderation decisions. Um, Does that mean the public interest? What do you think? Well, I would say you have to differentiate between kind of the public database, which is limited to content moderation decisions and the research data access request, which I read as being broader. Um, but then again, yeah, there's the, the question how do you know what to ask for? And then to what extent can you ask for a specific format? And that will be, I think, very much up to the, the digital services coordinators. So, uh, I mean, we've had some of those voluntary schemes in the past, like Social Science One, which uh, I think ended up not being that useful also because of some of the restrictions around the format. Like if you have to physically go to the offices of one of those companies, and then you can look at certain data, but you cannot, uh, combine it with other outside data sets, or you cannot take the data home with you or work across different jurisdictions with it, that might very much limit the usefulness of the provision. Um, so I think it will be very important between now and when this uh, becomes applicable next year for researchers to also engage uh, in this process. So the European Commission is planning to do a public consultation on this research data access, like how is it supposed to work in practice? And that is going to happen sometime uh, in the next uh, months or early next year at the latest. And there, I think it will be very useful to um, bring in these uh, practical experiences, like for example, how um, uh, the, the uh, A-B testing should be covered in it, because it might be one of those open questions. 
um, or also uh, how you need access to the data. Like, do you need API access or is it useful to get a hard drive sent in the mail that you can then do whatever you want with and how also to uh, combine data protection and trade secrets protection with uh, uh, the research interests in a meaningful way. Um, so I think, yeah, there are a lot of open questions around that, but there are also um, groups that are that are forming to try to inform that process and, and give advice to the European Commission. We'll move on to any other questions, but I commend to your attention uh, paragraph 96 in the recital, which I think gives sort of the, the framework in, within which such a request for AB data might take place. Please. Hi, um, I was wondering if you could respond to the requirement that only academic researchers or people affiliated with academic centers are allowed access um, because the Platform Accountability and Transparency Act in the US has taken a slightly different route where they've allowed NGO researchers. Mm -hmm. um, and there's upsides and downsides to both approaches. And I was wondering if you could um, respond to that. Yeah, so we actually um, fought for journalists and NGOs to be included in the data access provision. And um, I would say for uh, NGOs, we were relatively successful because if you look at the uh, definition of a research institution, it doesn't have to be a university. So it can be an NGO, um, but uh, it has to be basically doing uh, public interest research. So that means if you have an NGO that is kind of working on one of those systemic risks and the research is required uh, for the NGO to fulfill its public interest mission, then they should be able to make a research request. But a company would probably not be able to do so. So that means for journalists, which are usually, uh, you know, part of uh, for-profit newsrooms, this is probably going to be quite, quite limited. So it might be more, you know, which is a shame because we know that a lot of the, the important um, uh, stories that have come out of Lumen have been published like in the Wall Street Journal and journalists have been very active in using that. Um, so they might have more difficulty uh, using this, but for purely kind of public interest NGOs that are not uh, affiliated with the company, they should be able to make use of this provision. And it's definitely something that we also want to support. So if there is an NGO that has the in-house data analytics capacities to make use of those data, we would also be very interested in testing that in court because um, they sh really should be covered. And where journalists are concerned that are part of the company, um, they can still make use of the database of um, content moderation decisions. And I think it's worth noting that it also goes further than the Lumen database because it's not limited to content moderation decisions that are triggered by a notice. So if a platform makes content moderation decisions out of its own initiative, for example, to enforce its terms and ser or terms of service, they do have to provide an explanation to the user. So like if they uh, block you from uploading something, if they block your user account, or to some extent, even if they engage in shadow banning, and there again, you have the question, how do you know? That this has happened, but at least according to the law, they will have to provide an explanation for this and uh, will have to um, publish this information in the database, which would be accessible also to journalists. Other questions? We can take one more from the in-person audience and then we can... need to go to the Sky Lounge yeah. uh, in, in front here, please. It's a... Great, uh, thanks, um, Fafsh um, affiliate here. Um, question I have is about, um, maybe it's a question for Lumen and then ultimately could be reflected elsewhere. So the content moderation decisions are as a decision of, you know, based on policy internally. And I assume that sometimes what happens is you have research that says, hey, this policy is, clearly their policies are insufficient because you know, all of, we're seeing all of these things happen and they're bad for some reason, and the policy changes. And then you'll start seeing something else after that point. Is there any way in, in the Lumen database to see when a policy has changed? Can a corporation or a company decide to tell you that so that they can show that, hey, we've actually changed something that's updated, it's different from before, which would uh, sensibly help them, right, if they're under fire. 
or is that part of the the kind of game of the investigation and the research, which is to identify these things but not ever really know what's happening and what the constant moderation is as a result of? So that's a great question on several levels. I should begin with the disclosure that Lumen, because of its history, is a database of external requests to remove content. We don't have anything that would be characterized as an internal content moderation decision. We could ask that a lot. We'd love to, and that's one of the reasons that we're most excited about the DSA is because it's going to include all of a sudden this gigantic, you know, dark data set of content moderation decisions. So to the extent that that's your question, I, I, I don't have any explicit insight, but with respect to the broader, what if policies change? This gets to what Felix and Malta have described as you have to know what you're looking for before you look because it's a, it's there in the data, but it's usually not made explicit. So for example, um, relatively recently, Google was under severe legal pressure in Spain for what the Spanish Digital Protection Authority said was illegally sharing personal identifying information of Spanish citizens and implicitly of all EU citizens across the Atlantic to, to Lumen as part as part of their sharing with Lumen. And we were we were a little surprised to hear that because nothing had changed put it this way. And so without getting too deep into the weeds, what it turned out they were talking about was EU citizens attempting to exercise their rights under the GDPR. And I should say that unfortunately or fortunately, depending on your viewpoint, Luma does not have any GDPR-based requests. Um, regulators in the EU quite sensibly feel that that's kind of a snake eating its own tail thing, that the request to have something forgotten is then publicized somewhere else that sort of defeats the purpose. We think that there's a way to study those and we're advocating for that you know, in a safe way, but we don't have those. But especially in the earlier days of that regulation, people would say, oh, I want to send a GDPR request. And they would go to Google and they would find a form and they would fill it out thinking that they were sending a GDPR request. But in fact, they would be sending a copyright request, at least according to the form, which would be shared with Lumen. And so eventually this percolated out. The Spanish DPA said there's a whole bunch of these notices in Lumen, which we believe inappropriately contain personally identifying information, which really was usually just someone's name and a URL. And so they fined Google uh, like 10 million euros, something like that, like a large, but possibly not large to Google, sum of money. And so what Google did was they came to us and said, okay, we've just, we've just been found to have done this and we need to change the way in which we send you data. So going forward, we're just not gonna send you this category of data, which we have previously sent. And so that's a policy change. It's one you would immediately notice if you were someone already in the database saying, every week I want to see all the notices from Spain, because then they would just go to zero. But it's not something that would be explicitly announced as a change because it's sort of, it's definitely not a lie, but it's, it's, a, it's an action of omission rather than a deliberate activity. And so I think that characterizes a lot of our research that if, if you're already paying attention, you'll notice shifts, but there's no public statement of a policy shift. Whereas um, with the, the um, change of commission, we're usually quite public about it. We're thrilled to announce that Google is now gonna begin sharing takedown notices having to do with counterfeit goods. We've created a new notice category. You can find it here. So I think um, additions are gonna be pretty easy to notice, but that, um, subtractions or even worse, labeling shifts, like start calling this local law instead of other or some, you know, something something trivial like that will be much harder to notice unless you're already paying attention. And so I hope that people will set up, I guess, I don't know, what would you call it? Like background monitoring? Like we're, we're not actually like gonna pull it, but we just sort of, we're watching. Yeah. And we're looking for, oh, it changed, it changed. I think these kind of policies will play a huge role because all of these uh, very large platforms will have to 
uh, design their own risk mitigation measures. So they will all be forced to do something on things like uh, disinformation on elections, for example, if that's something that happens uh, in the context of their platform. But the exact measures will be largely left up to them. And so the hope of the EU legislature is that uh, researchers will use these data access provisions to monitor whether the risk mitigation measures are, are working. So there's also like, to, to an extent, the, the EU is putting a lot of uh, faith in all of you uh, to, to help them do their job because like the public regulator does not necessarily have all the, the data analytics and research expertise needed to really see whether these risk mitigation measures are working. So that's, I think the policies will play a huge role there. That's well put. Should we go to the Skylabs to you? We only have one minute left on the clock. Um, I hopefully will read this question correctly. But going back to potential research questions, this individual is asking about what your thoughts are on asking, or sorry, on state-run internet referral units and formally asking for takedowns. Specifically, systemic risks pertaining to freedom of expression and discrimination, um, since most of those requests appear to focus on minority groups and could consist of indirect state censorship. They also want to add that this question was inspired specifically about Facebook, quote unquote, voluntarily taking down drill music videos following the London Met Police informal requests. Um, I mean, I think you could ask uh, questions around that because it relates to the freedom of expression of users. Um, and I think these kinds of requests should be even easier to identify because there's probably a, an open line of communication between state authorities and the platforms already. So I think that would be a good example of what you could say. Yeah. Yeah, yeah my, my follow-up to that would be, I think that that's an extremely important potential risk to be of which to be aware, but that given the provisions of the DSA, I think that it's going to mitigate that kind of risk because those requests will in theory be in the database that there was a request to um or excuse me a record of a request for a platform to exercise content moderation according to its terms of service the piece that i don't know is that as i understand the database personally identifying information of requesters is meant to be shielded and that makes perfect sense but historically at least some of the platforms have drawn a pretty bright line between agreeing to shield if Adam Holland or Felix Rita sends a request versus government of X or ministry of X sends a request. And they actually want to be quite public about that. So I, I could see, in fact, this being a phenomenally transparent way that would actually lead to far fewer uses of that kind of soft power. I mean, you're the GDPR expert, but if it's like, a public authority saying, please take this down with that personal data? I mean. Yes, I think so, especially when it's really on individuals who you don't know otherwise. So it isn't as easy, I would say, under uh, GDPR, but at least uh, you could ask about like uh, extra information on how many cases or are there some specific issues and so on and you can also always ask if you are if you are affected on your own too then you can also ask because that then you're kind of opening up and uh, gdpr isn't any longer because it's on your own information kind of so but it could be an issue maybe where you also have to go to court to see there is a line of uh, GDPR maybe protecting such issues. Yeah, but even if certain data is redacted from the public database, you might be able to ask follow-up requests uh, through the data access provision and uh, provide a data protection strategy to the regulator and say, this is how we're planning to protect this data. Uh, if we get access to more. Yeah. So these are some of the questions that we would really like to test yeah. out. Um, and also really help with the researchers to draft such uh, concepts too. Yeah, so definitely if you want to make use on this, you don't necessarily have to be a GDPR expert. We're also 
um, kind of looking to bring people together with different types of expertise. Like, so we have the, the kind of EU legal expertise, we lack the data analysis expertise. So part of what is happening between now and when this all comes into effect is also to bring together the people who might be making uh, good use of those provisions and uh, yeah, make access requests to the platforms that would actually hold up uh, in court would be accepted by the regulators and would be useful to the researchers while also, of course, uh, protecting users' personal data. that wraps up for our virtual audiences. Anyone that we didn't get to, we will forward these questions to our panelists. But now we'll hand off the panelists to close out the show. And again, thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you all. Um, Felix Amante, would you like to make your, your one final pitch for contact uh, and participation? Yeah, I mean, uh, if you're already here, the best thing is just to stick around. I mean, we have this room uh, for a while longer. So if you're thinking of uh, a research issue that might uh, fit with this, please stick around and we can have a, a more targeted discussion on that. Marvelous. Thank you so much both for being here. This is exactly the kind of thing that I believe Bergman Klein exists to do, the kind of collaboration we want to have. And this is just, if you, if you, if you haven't got it yet, this is just an absolutely mind-blowing, zeitgeist-changing, phenomenal new piece of legislation and no one's really sure what's going to happen yet. We're glad you're on the case. Thank you.